Welcome to Showboat, a series of podcasts from the Battleship North Carolina in Wilmington. I'm your host, Mary Ames Booker, ship's curator. Together we'll discover the stories of an extraordinary ship that steamed into history, what makes her tick and keeps her going, and her vital contributions today. Join us as we share her adventures and celebrate the thousands of men who served on the most highly decorated American battleship of World War II. In our second episode, we talked about keeping the battleship in ship-shape condition. Today, we turn to the OS-2U Kingfisher airplane that is on the battleship's fantail. We asked Commander Dick Butler, retired U.S. Navy aviator and a battleship tour guide, to tell us about this plane. Well, good afternoon. I'm Dick Butler, and I'd like to tell you about the Battleship North Carolina's aviation department, and more specifically, the Kingfisher, which uh, is the aircraft, named for a bird, obviously. And uh, Battleship North Carolina had two most of its life. Originally, it had three. To give you a visual description of this aircraft, it's not what you think of in the way of a World War II fighter, the Hellcat or the Bearcat or the Corsair, which are beautiful airplanes. This is an airplane that was designed specifically by the Navy in the late 30s to replace the Seagull, what pilot would ever want to fly an airplane called the Seagull. But its mission was to fly off battleships and heavy cruisers uh, via catapult, we'll talk about those in a little bit, and then recover uh, in that they didn't have a flat deck, they had to land in the water, come alongside the air, the battleship, and be craned aboard. So as you look at the Kingfisher, you'll notice that it is a single-wing airplane that replaced a bi-wing airplane, that's how old this is, and it has a big pontoon on the bottom and two smaller pontoons on either wing to stabilize it. More importantly, you'll see that it has two seats in it. The front seat was for the pilot. The back seat was for the radio operator and also for the rear gunner. They had a 30-millimeter gun back there. The pilot also had a fixed 30-millimeter gun that shot through the propeller. The way they launched the aircraft, they would put it on the catapult, and the catapult consisted of about a 68-foot rail. Uh, The aircraft would sit at the end of it, they put a charge, a ballistic charge, in a piston-driven catapult. It was equivalent to roughly the charge that was in a five-inch shell. They would take the catapult, sat on top of a turret. They would rotate it out towards sea, preferably into the wind, fire the catapult, the 25, 20 to 25 knots of wind across the water with the forward speed of the ship, plus the charge of the catapult. We get the aircraft airborne with it hopefully a speed of about 65 knots, although this aircraft could fly as low as 55 knots. From that point, it would fly up, do its mission, climb up to altitude, which with a 450 horsepower engine took a while to get to 10,000 feet, almost 30 minutes. Once getting up to altitude, it would cruise at about 115 to 120 miles an hour, top speed about 150 miles an hour in a dive. So what I'm explaining to you is an aircraft that is designed for function, not for speed or beauty. In comparison, if you talk about the fighter aircraft, both the Japanese had and we had, they had 2,000 horsepower engines that fly at three to 400 miles an hour or some approaching 500 miles an hour. So you did not want to get spotted by a Japanese while flying a Kingfisher. It was usually not a good day. When the Kingfisher finished its mission, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, it would come back to the battleship. The battleship would make a turn uh, 45 degrees off the wind in either direction and then turn through the wind to 45 degrees on the other side. The mass of the battleship would smooth out the waves, which would leave a calm area uh, behind the ship. If you've ever been water skiing, you kind of know what that looks like uh, when a boat goes into a turn. The plane would land in the calm area then taxi up alongside the ship. In the meantime, the ship had dropped out a sled attached to a line on the, on the uh, battleship. And this sled was made out of rope and canvas skimmed along the top. The pilot would bring, would, using power, would, would taxi the Kingfisher up onto the recovery towed mat, had an automatic hooking device on the front of the pontoon. And once that had happened, the crane operator, in 
see a big crane on the back of the ship. They'd swing that over the side, attach a cable uh, to a, a hook that was right below, right behind the pilot seat, and bring the kingfisher up, put it back on the launching cradle on the, and on the catapult. I do want to add in a couple of instances, I want to go back to launching. Occasionally, the battleship would be in a carrier uh, battle formation, and they, they can't change course to get into the wind to launch it. So they had what they call a cross-deck launch. They would actually launch the uh, Kingfisher out to the side at a 90-degree angle to the ship, which was obviously more complicated for the pilot to get a crosswind and didn't have as much wind, but that would occasionally be used as well. So this is how we got the aircraft airborne. Once it was airborne, it performed its missions, which is somewhat reflective in its name. It's called Kingfisher OS2U. The O was for observation. The S was for scouting. The two is the initial production run was the second version of it. And the U stood for the manufacturer, which is Voigt Skiorski. Uh, the two of those companies were together back then. There were roughly 1,500 of these planes made. A lot of them were used in training in Pensacola and Jacksonville. They were used by the Coast Guard for any submarine patrol. Uh, they had other missions. They delivered mail. They pulled banners. They, they looked for submarines. They also carried two 100-pound bombs or two 325-pound depth charges. And there was one Kingfisher that was uh, in a joint effort credited with sinking a submarine off uh, Nags Head, uh, North Carolina, during the war on the East Coast. Quite often, these aircraft got uh, shot up. They got dinged up. They lost quite a few of them. And every time they would go back into port, we would replace them with new aircraft. The Kingfisher sitting on the ship's fantail is not original to the battleship. In August 1942, Ensign Mac Roebuck and aviation machinist mate Stanley Goddard were flying the plane from California to the Aleutian Islands. They encountered dense fog and crashed into Mount Buxton on Calvert Island in Canada. They were not hurt, but their plane was left to the elements. In 1963, Canadian authorities recovered the plane and shipped it to the Air Museum in Calgary. After years of discussions, the plane wreckage arrived in Wilmington and was then sent to Dallas, Texas for restoration. There are 12 members of the Vote Quarter Century Club applied their incredible skills, and put the Kingfisher back together. We are grateful for their dedication and work to save this plane. In June 1971, the Kingfisher returned to Wilmington and has been gracing the fantail ever since. Over the decades, the plane has been maintained, but like the battleship herself, it was time again to examine the structure and apply new paint. And like before, it was a dedicated group of volunteers who took on the task, meeting a few surprises along the way. Local project manager David Pittman volunteered to lead the restoration effort. David, how did this project begin? Local battleship volunteer Gerald Eckstein uh, had told me about this Carolina's chapter of the U.S. Navy's Flight Deck Veterans Group, and that they had restored aircraft on the Yorktown down in Charleston. And they would love the opportunity to restore the aircraft with me on the battleship North Carolina. So we put together a project and set up a budget. And on weekends from December 2017 through May 2018, uh, everyone converged from all over the Carolinas to Wilmington and uh, spent the weekend sanding, scraping, and repriming and painting the aircraft. We first started uh, with pressure washing the aircraft because we thought that we would just chip off the worst layers uh, where the paint had pitted and then just paint over that and clean it up. But as we started doing that, we noticed that like on the pontoon section, there was so many layers of paint that was just flaking off. We determined the pontoon had to be completely hand sanded. And it had to be hand sanded because there's hundreds of rivets all over that pontoon. And, and you have to hand sand around every rivet or you end up sanding down the rivet. And we replaced hundreds of rivets on this aircraft along with the aircraft aluminum uh, on several sections of the wing and fuselage. Uh, eventually, we decided that the whole plane, we would just sand the whole plane down to the 
base primer and metal. So we sanded the entire aircraft down. Uh, we took off the ailerons and the uh, flaps. We built a paint booth uh, made of scaffolding and tarps on the uh, fan tail of the battleship and moved everything into it to be primed and painted separately uh, because it was always windy on the fan tail. When it came time to actually prime and paint the aircraft, we erected scaffold all around the, the airplane and tied tarps to the scaffolding so that the scaffolding was higher than the airplane. And so as we painted, then no paint or primer would leave that area and get on other areas of the ship. So that was very labor-intensive, labor um, erecting the scaffolding and, and taking everything apart, putting everything back together, and trying to figure out how all this would work on this airplane because we had no schematics or anything to deal with. The paint itself is not, is not a mil-spec aircraft paint that the military would normally use. It is a paint that the battleship had used uh, that was great for a marine environment. The Flight Deck Veterans Group likes to call it boat paint, so they give me a hard time about that. The paint has held up really well uh, in this marine environment uh, with this airplane sitting on the fan tail in all kinds of weather and hurricanes, and rain, sleet, snow, everything. The canopy, the canopy had um, totally degraded to where it had to be completely rebuilt from scratch. So parts had to be machined uh, individually, and this thing had to be completely reassembled with new uh, plexiglass and, and new parts, which was like its own mini project. And without the help of someone like uh, Kerry Wilkinson, who works for Boeing, and uh, J.R. Bax, one of our main uh, painters, without those individuals, I really don't know how that would have, that project part would have been done. It was it was a major, major ordeal to, to do something like this, considering there's only eight of these aircraft, seven or eight of these aircraft left in the world. And we needed to be extra careful to make sure that it was restored properly. How did you choose the paint scheme? Looked at old photographs, black and white photographs. We tried to say, okay, is that a is that a blue? Is that a light blue? And we did more research and found out that that there was a three tone paint scheme used for those uh, kingfishers based on just photographs. Jr. A lot of uh, Kerry Wilkinson they hand painted it just by eye. They just they just eyeballed it. They just looked at the side of the plane and said, okay, it kind of needs to swoop up here, and they just swooped it up there. We didn't use any tape and tape-off areas because it's supposed to feather from one area into the next with no hard lines, and if you tape off an area and paint, you're getting a hard line. Part of the camouflage is, is the feathering between the colors. So if you're looking down on the aircraft, you see the blue, and if you look up the aircraft, you're looking at white, um, such as if you're looking up in the clouds. So I think they did an amazing job uh, having never painted anything like this before and just freehanded it. It was an amazing job by those guys. The aviation detachment, which was the V division, was part of the battleship's gunnery department. During the war, three aviators, who were officers, and up to 20 enlisted men were assigned to the division. The enlisted rates included aviation radio men and other specialties in aviation repair, maintenance, and ordnance. The division even had its own supply clerk and photographer. The planes on the North Carolina had two key roles, spotting gunfire and search and rescue. First, spotting gunfire. During a shore bombardment, two planes were launched to fly over the targets to observe the spot where the shells landed. The aviators were in radio contact with the ship and called out corrections to where the shell landed, such as, up 100, left 50, which meant the burst landed 100 yards short and 50 yards to the right of the target. Depending on the engagement, aviators were eyes in the skies for hours before refueling. The battleship North Carolina took part in the campaign for Iwo Jima in February 1945. The island had two airfields and was heavily protected. For two days, BB-55 bombarded the island before the Marines landed. The bombardment continued for another four days, and spotters were needed. Aviators Lt. Paul Wogan, Lt. J.G. Roscoe Werder, and 20-year-old Ensign Al Oliver were well prepared for their mission. Commander Oliver later explained. See, first of all, our, our participation would start before we left port. You had this whole thing laid out in op orders and op plans and uh, 
You know, the Marines had it, the Navy had it, the, the amphibs had it, everybody had their own part and everything. So we'd end up going over to the Mount McKinley, which was a command ship. And all these, all the brass was there, and they'd just take, break out the plans, and they'd go through item by item, who was doing what, where, when, and how, and what have you. And we had a part in all that. So our job would all be in that, in that and we'd be specifically what we're supposed to do. So we'd go over there with the part of the briefing. And for Okinawa, for Iwo Jima, I remember this. They had a table in the middle of the wardroom of this Mount McKinley that was probably 20 feet by 10 by 20 feet. And in the middle of that thing was a rubberized miniature Iwo Jima, maybe 15 foot long, a model. And they had uh, photographs, aerial photographs taken at ground level at 20,000 feet. I mean, this thing with coverage was unbelievable. I mean, by the time you, see, you, you look at all this stuff and you go to Iwo Jima, there's nothing because you've already seen it. <laughs> and then, as I said, we have these grid charts, which were very, very accurate, covering, they were all grids into, you know, like, like okay, you got grid number uh, 112. And then in 112, you had A, B, 3, all these no letters, all numbered. And, and, and so, you know, if you wanted to say, okay, I want to hit target down here in this place, I'd just call out. The grid, mm -hmm. and everybody knew. So everybody had the same grid. Very well done. Very well done. On February 21st, Wogan and radio man Elton Means launched at 1017. At 1058, Oliver and radio man Thomas Dunn, with gridded target maps in hand, launched. And soon BB-55 began firing her secondary battery, the 5-inch 38 caliber shells. The radio log provides a transcript of the communication among the ship, Oliver's plane, and the shore fire control party helping direct gunfire from the ground. The Kingfishers were flying low and slow, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 feet altitude, at speeds of 90 to 140 miles per hour. Oliver and Dunn were asked to make low passes over areas to try and locate enemy gun positions. It was dangerous work. For example, they were asked to investigate a canyon area where vehicles were seen, and Oliver soon felt large explosions overhead. He looked up to discover a flight of torpedo bombers dropping their loads, and he later discovered holes in his plane's wings. For six hours, Oliver and Dunn spotted the bombardment and then returned safely to the ship. Oliver was awarded the Air Medal for Meritorious Achievement in Aerial Flight, for his service over Iwo Jima, and subsequently, Okinawa. The second primary role of the Kingfishers was to pick up American pilots who had been shot down by enemy fire or had to ditch damaged or malfunctioning aircraft. Two heroic search and rescue missions were carried out by North Carolina aviators. Commander Dip Butler describes the amazing rescue in the waters off Truck Island in April 1944. If you haven't heard of the Truck Islands, there's a good reason. They're about 600 miles southeast of Guam. And for you history buffs, I'm talking about April 30th. If you recall, in the time period between July and August 1944, is when we retook Guam from the Japanese. So this is on the march going north towards Japan to put bases together where we could have air support for both naval and air force operations. On that morning, carriers were attacking truck. Word came back that there was a pilot shot down the previous night. He had managed to paddle inside a reef to the open water where he was spotted. The skipper of the battleship, North Carolina, came to uh, the pilots, Ken and Burns and another pilot, and told them they needed to get up and get this person out. So they both took off, flew on out there. The other pilot landed first, spotted the pilot in the open water, went in to pick him up. Uh, unfortunately, the water is rather choppy. Uh, and in the process, the pilot that was in the water uh, grabbed a hold of one of those small sponsons on the outside between the wind and wave action. The airplane flipped over. At that point, other pilot with, uh, with John Burns uh, went into the water along with his radio man. So now we have three downed aviators in the water. Seeing this, Lieutenant Burns decides to land. He's got his radio operator in the back as well. So they find both of them. They pick up 
all three people, the down pilot from the night before, his shipmate pilot, and his radio man. And then now they've got a problem. There's a submarine waiting to rescue them, but they're inside the reef atoll, and the sub can't get in there because it's too shallow. So he taxis five to six miles out to sea. There he's met by the sub, the USS Tang, who took all three men aboard. This in itself is a major feat, but we aren't even anywhere it's near finished. As he's dropping those people off, they got a message that another pilot has been shot down close to the reef as well. At that point, Lieutenant Burns, now having rescued three people already, took off, landed, and got that gentleman up on the wing. As soon as he got up on the wing, he heard of another plane ditched. And after about two hours of taxing around inside the lagoon, or inside the reef, he found a crew of three from a uh, torpedo bar. Now there, he picked those people up. Now there are four people on the wing, the first pilot and the crew of three. While he was picking them up, that crew that just got shot down, the crew of three, said they saw another plane ditch. So rather than heading back out, Lieutenant Burns starts taxing around, and they found, and it took a couple of hours, they found a crew of three from that plane. We now have seven people aboard a Kingfisher. This is the plane that has seats for two people, uh, both of which were filled by Burns and his radio man. So these five additional people are on the wings and on the pontoons. The airplane wasn't designed for it. Obviously can't take off and fly. So Lieutenant Burns taxis the aircraft out back out to the uh, USS Tank submarine. These people are hanging on for dear life. In the meantime, the tail of the airplane is dragging in the water. Pontoons rupture or taking out the water. Uh, as the plane is in dire shape, it finally finds the submarine. And a total of 10 people were rescued by Lieutenant Burns that day. The Unfortunately, the airplane was so destroyed, Lieutenant Burns was asked to go below, and the crew of the submarine shot Kingfisher and sank it so the enemy wouldn't get it. There's a epitaph to this that you need to, to hear. One, he was awarded the Navy Cross for his action. The skipper of the Tang was pretty well associated with people back in Washington and said, son, I was quite impressed by what you did today. Is there anything I can do for you? He said, I would much rather be flying fighters than kingfishers. That said, Commander Kane, uh, in fact, got him a slot in training. Approximately a half a year later, unfortunately, Lieutenant Burns was killed training to fly Hellcats. But it is just a wonderful story of a rescue and great bravery. And this is what the kingfisher did. It saved people's lives. And the second heroic rescue? I now want to fast forward to August 10th, 1945. We are marching onto the main island of Japan, Honshu, and we are uh, bombing Tokyo, which is quite a bit farther south than where this took place. I want to move up to the very northern part of the island of Honshu, an area called Mutusu Wan Bay. It's also the location of the Amanato Naval Air Station, which is a combination Navy base and runway to the north of a bay, and this is not a very big bay, it's about three miles wide, and to the south there is an army base. So on the morning of August 10th, Lieutenant Oliver and Lieutenant Jacobs, the two pilots, volunteered to go in and pick up a pilot that had been shot down the previous night and swam into the shoreline. In addition to the close proximity of the Naval Air Station and the Japanese, which of course both have guns that are going to be shooting at whoever's trying to pick them up. The weather is terrible. It's foggy. It's blowing about 30 miles an hour from the west to the east. The entrance to this uh, lagoon faces west, and the down pilot is on the eastern shore, so there are heavy waves breaking on shore. To give you an idea of the danger involved, they launched, they have eight fighter escorts, four Hellcats and four Corsairs to join them. Lieutenant Oliver and Jacobs fly to some 200 miles. Lieutenant Jacobs was the senior pilot, so he said he would go down and try and rescue the pilot first. He goes in, he lands successfully, makes it into the Bay Area, sees the pilot, the pilot comes out into the surf, trying to get on board, and there are no radio men on either either aircraft, so the back seat is empty. In the attempts to get out to the aircraft, the down pilot is unable to get to the plane, so Lieutenant Jacobs stands up, tries to throw him a life ray. Unfortunately, as he did that, between the surf and the wind, he falls out of the aircraft, and as he falls out, his foot hits the throttle, which goes to the full open position. Lieutenant Oliver up above is wondering why he hasn't taken off, and then all of a sudden sees the aircraft starting to move, and he goes, great, he's about to take off. Shortly thereafter, the airplane starts going around in 360-degree circles with the enemy shooting shells at it the entire time. He goes, obviously something's not right. So he flies down, takes a look at the plane, and it's 
absolutely stunned to see there's no pilot, no rescue pilot in the backseat. He sees waving frantically in the shoreline. So Lieutenant Oliver lands in the heavy seas. Now he has to figure out how to safely get in and pick him up. He turns his aircraft into the wind to the west, uh, which is going at 30 miles an hour. Heavy surf breaking on shore. He literally lets the wind and the wave action push him back into shore using his power and rudder on the aircraft, keeping it into the wind. Gets through the surf, actually puts the back of the pontoon up onto the beach, whereupon uh, Lieutenant Jacobs and the down pilot get on board. Lieutenant Oliver tells them, I, he has these two big, heavy, wet, soaking guys in the back. He said, one of you is going to have to get out. He mentioned that to Jacobs as the down pilot kind of got first priority. And both of them looked at each other and said, we aren't getting out. No way. <laughs> and they didn't want to spend the night under fire next to the enemy. So he said, okay. He manages to taxi out through the heavy surf, gets outside the lagoon, gets the aircraft airborne, overweighted, flies 200 miles back to the North Carolina, lands, gets the plane back on board. They said he had about a couple of gasoline left. So despite huge, huge enemy presence, bad weather conditions and everything else, just an extraordinary rescue, unbelievable rescue and bravery. For this, he received the Distinguished Flying Cross of the Navy. To broaden our understanding of the U.S. Navy carrier aviators in the Pacific Theater, Air Sea Rescues, and in particular the events of August 10th, 1945, I'm talking with author Martin Irons. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you, Mary. I'm really excited about this. It's an opportunity to really focus on something that was really rare, kind of complex, and uh, just exceedingly courageous. Martin is the author of Phalanx Against the Divine Wind, Protecting the Fast Carrier Task Force During World War II, published in 2017 by Merriam Press, the book follows the destroyer Hainsworth, DD-700, and the brave men serving as Squadron 2 in early 1945 as they faced the Japanese kamikaze attacks. The stories are told through first-hand accounts. Martin has a new book coming out this year called Corsair Down, Tales of Rescue and Survival During World War II, which includes the story of Oliver and Jacob's Honshu Rescue. Tell us about your new book. This new book actually sprung out of Phalanx Against the Divine Wind. I was doing all the, the research about what the destroyers did while protecting the aircraft carriers. They rescued a lot of pilots, a lot of pilots and aircrew from down planes. So I, I developed this list of all these pilots, and it was kind of an intriguing project because I hadn't seen anything like this done before. And I, I just kind of got into researching the Corsair pilots Corsair was my favorite plane as a kid, and actually started from the beginning of the war, went right to the end, and looked at a thousand different Corsair crashes during World War II, and you can imagine with uh, that many planes down, there were a lot of interesting stories of uh, rescue out there. You're reading about pilots who were wounded and had to fly back 200 miles, um, blind in one eye, pilots that had to fly through... uh, were they so bad that uh, they couldn't find their ship? A pilot that was shot down over Indochina was smuggled out of Indochina with other pilots after they joined the French Foreign Legion. So um, from blimps, submarines, to kingfishers, um, there are lots of tales of rescue. So I interviewed 15 World War II pilots. Most of them were Corsair pilots. Some of them weren't, but uh, the ones that weren't were relevant to the story, having been in the same place and the same carriers just to get some perspective about it. The downed airmen Oliver and Jacob's Rescue was Lieutenant J.G. Vernon Coombe from the carrier Essex. How did he wind up needing assistance? So his background, in 1944, the Navy created the Fast Carrier Task Force, which was a a large group of uh, aircraft carriers who with them steamed cruisers and battleships and destroyers, all of them capable of greater than 30 knots. It was a great flexible weapon. The range was really about 700 nautical miles in a day. As we pushed the outer rings of the Japanese Empire closer and closer to the home island, the amount of flying and fighting the Navy did increased dramatically. By 45, we had the capability of putting a thousand planes in the air for attacks over the course of the day. 
What was Coombs' perspective on the events of August 9th and 10th? This really kind of brings us to the USS Essex. So in mid-August, a strike was sent against Matsuwan Bay, northern Honshu. It was a long flight in, and one pilot, Lieutenant J.G. Vernon Coombs, was shot down in the strike. What you want to do if your plane is hit is try to get off the coast, get out to sea. Somewhere out there might be an American submarine pre-positioned for rescue. Coombs' plane was fatally hit. He ditched in Matsuwan Bay and managed to get safely out of his plane, get into his little pilot's raft, which is about the tiniest raft you ever saw. You wouldn't let your kid go in it. It's so small, you, would, you wouldn't think it would hold anybody up. He kept himself out in the bay all day, and at night he paddled into, uh, into the shore and hid. A plan was hatched to bring in a rescue plane, bring in a little kingfisher from the North Carolina, escorted by a second kingfisher, and a third kingfisher is going to come along from the Pasadena. So Vernon Coombe spent the night on the coast hiding in some bushes, praying that he might be rescued, but also kind of faced with the knowledge that his carrier might just uh, be done. It, it was quite possible the Essex was going to return to America. And so at that point, his chances of rescue would, would, would have been slim to none. So on the morning of August 10th, Vernon Coom, who had been hidden all night, uh, kept his ears open and his eyes wide, and sure enough, his uh, squadron actually attacked a target south of Matsuwan. As soon as they were done attacking the target, they flew north, they flew over Matsuwan Bay, and Coom recognized the sound of the Pratt & Whitney engines and the Hellcats and the Corsairs, came out from his hiding place and waved. His buddies waggled their wings back in recognition that they saw him, and then they left. Just so if they had stayed, they would have drawn attention to him. So he knew he had been seen. It was early in the day, so the chances of having a rescue plane actually come out were actually pretty good. The North Carolina launched their two Kingfishers. Third Kingfisher flew with them from the USS Pasadena, piloted by Lieutenant Woodrow Bourne. As they got closer to Honshu, Bourne was actually called away to rescue another pilot. So it was the two Kingfishers and, and three Corsairs and a Hellcat coming in to Matsuwan. Coombe heard the sound of the planes, got in his raft, started to get out as far as he could into the bay, and he was having trouble. One of his buddies in a Corsair, Clem Ware, decided that he would drop another raft to so he came in low over the bay. It's believed that as he lifted a raft and tried to throw it over the left side of the cockpit, that a strap from the parachute actually got caught in the plane throttle and changed the throttle position. And the plane stalled out, and Clem Ware crashed into Matuan Bay. Horrifying for Coombe to see the fellow pilot from the squadron killed. The first Kingfisher was able to land successfully, he taxied on the water. Coombe was having a hard time. He was just exhausted trying to get up onto the pontoon and, and climb into the plane. So Jacobs got out. He what he could do assist, but he accidentally pushed his throttle forward. So his little kingfisher took off across the bay, still on the water. He's in the water. Coombe's in the water. And at this point, the naval base is fully alerted to this and starts shelling Coombe and the Kingfisher take the attention away from Coombe and Jacob in the water. Another pilot came down and strafed the first Kingfisher, burned it up. Of course, that diverted the guns over to the burning Kingfisher. That gave Oliver the chance he needed. He landed his Kingfisher, actually backed it up onto the beach until he was the first American plane to land on Japan. And picked up Coombe, said that somebody would come back for Jacob. Jacob said, no way. And uh, both of the two pilots, Jacob and Coombe, climbed into the back seat of the little plane. That made the plane very tail heavy. The Kingfishers are pretty light plane. And it took him a long time to 
to get off the water, but Oliver finally did. And with the help of the uh, escort, she was able to safely return both pilots all the way to the North Carolina. So I believe it was about 250 miles each way. That's a really long flight. And the flight from catapult launch to recovery, six hours, an amazing feat. Oliver and Jacobs both deservedly won a distinguished flying cross for their effort. So Coombe actually, uh, interestingly enough, Coombe was brought back to the Essex, but as it turns out when he got there, he discovered that the fighter plane that crashed, trying to throw him a res- throw him the, the rescue raft, was flown by his buddy Clem Ware. So it was devastating to learn that his closest friend had been killed in, in the rescue attempt. The next combat mission, August 15th, uh, the Essex, again, they didn't go home. They put their planes in the air to go attack Japan, and they had just gotten to Japan when word came to drop their bombs at sea and return to the Essex. The war was over. You have done extensive research about air-sea rescues in the Pacific. How rare were the truck and Honshu rescues? So prior to 1944, if you flew from a carrier, you really had very little chance of rescue if your plane went down at sea. If there were submarines in the area, they would be directed, but it's a big ocean. The Pacific was six, still is six million square miles. The only planes that were capable of rescue within the fast carrier task force were the kingfishers carried on the sterns of the cruisers and the battleships, but they were not carried. It was never the intention to use these planes as as rescue planes. The Kingfisher's a small plane. Uh, it was catapulted off the stern. The recovery method meant that the ship made a big turn, so there was kind of a, a smooth weight for the plane to land in. Nobody would ever design a plane that small for open sea landings and takeoffs. Even for the bigger planes, people, are, a lot of folks are familiar with the PBY Catalinas, but you might see Jacques Cousteau used one post-war. Seeing these planes, you hear about them doing rescues, especially in the Solomon Islands. But for everyone, probably for actually every two that landed in a rescue attempt, one of those Catalinas was destroyed. Even though it was a big plane, a lot sturdier, it's very difficult for an open sea landing for a, for a plane. And later in the war, we had big Martin Mariners, huge planes. They had uh, their wings were higher up off the water, so they sustained less damage. But even though we had these Martin Mariners, we had squadrons of Martin Mariners starting in March 1945 that were there to do air sea rescues in the Okinawa, southern Japan area. The real goal of their rescue missions was not to actually put the plane on the water. The goal was to orbit the pilot drop supplies, stay there until a surface vessel or a submarine could rescue the pilot. Only if there was no other choice would they land on the water. So air sea rescue is not common. When it was avoided whenever possible. So if you look at the course of almost two years of fast carrier task force operations, now, there were typically about a, a dozen cruisers and battleships, which means there were at least 24 kingfishers at a minimum, or steagles, um, or some other similar float plane. Even then, there were less than seven dozen pilot rescues by kingfishers with the fast carrier task force in World War II. So Coombs is rescued by Oliver one of the rarest forms of rescue. And just in comparison, U.S. submarines rescued 2,400 people. The Air Ground Aid Service in China helped nearly 900 pilots escape out of China. So we're, like again, Kuma is really about one of 70 or so pilots saved by kingfishers. Oliver. Oliver did something amazingly difficult, complex, and brave. Thank you for joining me today with our latest edition of the Showboat Podcast.
We're going to let Commander Al Oliver have the last word about the OS-2U Kingfisher airplane. Well, having flown a lot of different airplanes and some very high performance, you have to say that the Kingfisher is a very low performance airplane doing a low performance job. It's designed to do that. In the very reliable water airplane, uh, you have an R985, I think, engine, which is probably the most reliable engine, airplane engine ever built. Uh, the, uh, the airplane is, was uh, very sturdy, a good water plane. It was low performance, it was low gear, uh, and it was all designed to be that. Uh, it wasn't a fighter. <laughs> It, it, it was a water plane. It was a plane to go out and, and you're going to operate off a ship in the middle of the ocean. And you're going to land this monster in the middle of the ocean. And that's not going to be a nice, pleasant place. So it's a rugged airplane to do a rugged job. So I, I, I put it in a highly reliable place. It's a very high reliable airplane to do exactly what it was designed to do. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I'm Mary Ames Booker, host and producer of the podcast. Showboat is a series of podcasts about the battleship North Carolina in Wilmington, North Carolina. Visit us online at www.battleshipnc.com. The Showboat welcomes visitors daily. In 2020, the battleship North Carolina received an NC CARES Humanities Relief Grant from the North Carolina Humanities Council, www.nchumanities.org. Funding for NC Cares has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act Economic Stabilization Plan.